welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 285, The Balancing Act of Historical Fiction, a teaching episode with Amanda Cabot, coming to you on Thursday, March 10th, 2022. So as I've mentioned in the recent past, we're doing things differently in 2022. The new schedule will be a monthly Encouraging Words episode, because I love them and I've heard from you that you love them. But instead of 50 interviews for the whole year, we'll be doing eight to 10 teaching episodes that are really solid teaching like that you would get in a class or if you went to a workshop or conference. This is going to be better for both of us because we will both get more writing done, which is what we need. Write a book, change the world. If we're not writing any books, well, we're not changing the world in that way. <laughs> so hopefully both of us will get more writing done. And the whole point of the teaching episodes is, is that instead of interviewing every wonderful person who's got a great book, I specifically want to get people on the show who are really good teachers to teach us very specific craft things, or perhaps I'll have somebody who gives me an idea for teaching you something else, um, you know, like business stuff or, or something like that. But this is specifically to help us to become better writers. So for instance, Amanda Cabot, our guest today, she's already taught this class many times live at conferences and that sort of thing. So now we're just doing it on a podcast episode so that you can listen to it anytime. So um, next month, our writer teacher will be Susan May Warren, and she'll be teaching us how to plan and write a series. Also, a very practical, hands-on thing that we can learn, um, apply now, and make our books better. So here's to another year of even more writing, even better writing. And now let's listen to Amanda Cabot as she helps us to understand the balancing act of writing historical fiction and all the ways that this is going to help you to improve your historical fiction books. And if you're not writing historical fiction and you listen, you'll probably also keep on finding some great tips that will help you in the books that you are writing. Great. So without further ado, let's listen to Amanda. Today's guest is Amanda Cabot. Amanda is the best-selling author of Out of the Embers and Dreams Rekindled, as well as the Cimarron Creek Trilogy and the Texas Crossroads, Texas Dreams, and Westward Winds series. Her books have been finalists for the ACFW Carroll Awards, the Holt Medallion, and the Booksellers Best. She lives in Wyoming. Welcome, Amanda. Kitty, it is so wonderful to be back with you. These are always fun times. I have to say, you're a lovely guest, and I always enjoy having you on the show. So thank you, especially because I'm doing something new, and you were like, yeah, me. That sounds interesting. Yay. So, so this is what we're going to do. You've actually taught this class before, the Balancing Act of Historical Fiction, uh, live and in person, as uh, hopefully we are about ready to get back into more across the world. But in the meantime, I think a lot of us have gotten pretty used to finding really interesting things online that we can consume immediately and not have to fly someplace, which also has its, its pros along with it. Uh, so I am super excited. We're going to do sort of like a teaching class as if we're you're talking to all the people in front of you and i'll sometimes get to be the student and ask some questions as we would in class and then we'll just learn a lot about uh, you have written lots of historical fiction so we're going to get this really kind of lovely master class from you on how we can do that better Sounds good to me excellent okay ready for me to start I'm ready. Let's let's get started. I wasn't sure how to introduce you, but yeah, let's just go ahead and jump in. <laughs> okay. Um, my qualifications for this are I've written more than 40 novels. Um, more than half of those are historical. I've also written contemporary, and I've done nonfiction books as well. So I've written in a lot of genres, but my heart is with historical fiction. And a friend of mine, a very dear writer friend, says that's because I was born in the wrong century. I really belong back in the 19th century. Okay, we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to talk about today is the balancing act of historical fiction. The reality is that all writing include involves balancing. 
but there are special considerations for historical fiction. And I wanna talk about that. So what are we balancing? Three things, reader expectations, editor expectations, if we are looking for traditional publishing and our own dreams, and they can be in conflict. Reader expectations are typically set by cover art. If you look at the cover of The Spark of Love, which is my new book, it'll pretty much tell you that this is historical fiction. And you'll probably figure out that it's a romance because we have my heroine on the cover. Reader expectations are also set by the back cover copy, by the genre, and by the author's name. Uh, because as authors, we try to brand things. Editor expectations are different. When they see a manuscript, they have one question. Is this sellable? Am I going to be able to sell it to, first of all, the publishing committee, uh, to my sales force, and ultimately to customers? Our dreams may be different from those. We may dream about writing something that won't fit into traditional categories that an editor is going to buy. Fortunately, there is now the whole option of going as indie publishing, so we can achieve our dreams even if we don't, if our books don't fit into that category. But on to what are we balancing? The first major thing that you have to balance is information versus entertainment. Good writing includes both, but the focus varies. When we're dealing with nonfiction, the primary focus is information. You pick up an, a nonfiction book and you want to learn something. That's the primary reason you're picking it up. But if there isn't some kind of an entertainment factor, you're not gonna keep reading. And I found that with the four nonfiction books that I wrote, that if you just have a complete information dump and it's totally boring prose, it doesn't matter how valuable your information is, people aren't going to read it. So there needs to be a small entertainment component there. When I we're found dealing that with, with I, I was just gonna say, I found that with the Malcolm Gladwell books. I've gotten to the point where I don't care what he writes about, he writes it in such an interesting way that I'm just determined uh, that I not, I don't have to determine. I already feel like I know that I can just buy and read one of his books and it'll be super interesting and just really enjoyable to learn something that maybe I never even thought I wanted to learn. And, and see, that's the thing. It's the balance. Yeah. You know, and it's that combination. Now, with fiction, of course, our primary focus is entertainment. But at the same time, people like to learn something. And that's particularly true in historical fiction. There are the little tidbits that we put into our books that make them, there's information as well as entertainment. And I remember a book I read as a teenager it was set in the War of 1812. The heroine was an actress. I don't remember the title. I don't remember the author's name. What I remember is learning that in, they didn't have mascara then. What they used was liquid wax, and they put that on their eyelashes. Wow. Wow. That tidbit has stayed with me for, well, more than 10 years. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's that combination that makes it so much fun to read and write historical fiction. But the balance is critical. And of course, when, that's the added dimension, the history. How much history do readers expect? And the answer is that that depends on the category of the book. I divide historical fiction into two categories. One is fictionalized history, and the second one is period fiction. And I write the latter. Let's start with fictionalized history. In that, the events of the period play a critical role in the story itself. That's why we call it fictionalized history. Notice that the history yeah. 
now I'm there. You know, that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about um, giving a name to the two kinds because that's the kind <laughs> I really don't like that much. I don't know yeah. why, but every time somebody, my friend just um, suggested that I read The Red Tent, she's like, it's wonderful. It's just so beautiful. And it's like story of all these people in the Bible, like in this really storytelling sort of way. And for some reason I was like, oh my gosh, I can't get through this book. But <laughs> give me like Tessa Dare's historical fiction, which is completely fictional. And I know there's no way that people actually said and did some of the things that she puts in the book because she's appealing to contemporary readers. And I'm like, I don't care. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> and when I get to the last point on here, I think you'll find out why oh, okay. you don't like books like The Red Tent. All right. So we've got fictionalized history, which is one of my two big categories. Now I've divided that into two subcategories. The first one is where main characters are well-known historical figures. And a lot of biblical fiction is like that. Um, Jill Eileen Smith has a new release called The Prince and the Prodigal. And she's dealing with Joseph and his brother Judah. So we have, these are the main characters and they're real people. Then we have the second category is the main characters are fictional or less well-known. An example of that is Karen Harper's Mistress Shakespeare, where there were two women named Anne in Shakespeare's life. And she's telling us about the one we don't know much about. We all know about Anne Hathaway. But there was another Anne, Anne Waitley. Interesting, Interesting book. In both cases, Historical events form the framework of the plot. And I use that frame, that word framework very deliberately. If you think about the journalistic five W's, readers know what happened, where it happened, when it happened. The book provides answers to why and makes the who come to life but you already know basically what's going to happen. And I think that's why these books, fictionalized history doesn't really appeal to you, Kitty. Oh, because I already know what's what's already happened in these people's lives. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, but you're not telling me anything new. Oh, do you think that's the exactly. Right? I mean, the idea with fictionalized history is to provide new perspectives, Yeah. but the element of surprise of what's going to happen next isn't there. Right. So the, probably for someone like me, the only way not to say though, but but in broad strokes, the only way to enjoy a book like that is perhaps for me to read about a book where I know nothing about this historical event. Exactly. Oh. And, and you might find the the Shakespeare's wife story interesting because you don't know much. Yeah. But when we're dealing with the ones where the main characters are real people, it's different. I mean, because you know what's happening. You yeah. know, if you've got fictionalized history of Abraham Lincoln, you know how it's going to end. Yeah. It's not a happy ending. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, all the while you're reading it, even though you may be learning new bits of information, you still know how it's going to end. So... It, it's a different reading experience. Yeah. So then we go to period fiction, which is what I write and what you read. Yeah. <laughs> and in this case, the main characters are fictional. Historical personages, if any, play a minor role. And historical events form the backdrop, but not the framework to the story. It's a way different focus. Why do we care about this? Well, readers want to be transported to a different time. And they want to learn about that time, but from the view of ordinary people. And the emphasis is on the lifestyle. So it's really different. I mean, what we're dealing with here is a period that we're trying to make come to life. I mean, I write about the 19th century primarily. And so what I'm trying to do is 
transport readers back to the 19th century, ignoring things like there wasn't indoor plumbing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but what they're trying to do is have an experience and see what was life like then. And yes, we do romanticize it a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I will say, um, in Spark of Love, your book that, that I've been reading, um, there were two things that already, like, like, like you said, um, something that's just struck me and is staying with me. Uh, I may forget the characters' names, but I'm like, I had no idea that some stagecoaches, because I've never seen it in a movie, and that's why, that some stagecoaches had the, the front-facing seat, the back-facing seat, and a middle bench. I'm like a middle bench. What? And then I'm like trying to imagine what's it like to ride on the middle bench. You don't have a back. You're probably pressed up against the person behind you. And that would be very irritating. And the whole time that I'm reading this chapter, all I can think about is the people who are sitting in the middle bench. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be there. And some of the stage coaches had seats on top of the stage coach. Outside now, on top on the yeah. roof. Whoa. Now, you really, really don't want to be there. Yeah. It's dusty. You're going to get sunburned. If it, Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I don't put my characters there. Although, to think of it, I should have some villains. I can there you have go. them sit on top of the stagecoach. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk primarily, well, we're going to talk primarily about period fiction here um, and balancing reader expectations. So the first thing is, what are reader expectations for historical facts? And how many is too many? Um, for that, I want to read you the beginning of Paper Roses. This was my first book in the Texas Roses, uh, the Texas Dreams series. And I have modified this. It starts off March, 1856. It'll be all right. Sarah Dobbs wrapped her arms around the child, wishing with all her heart that she could believe the words she'd uttered so often. The truth was it didn't matter what she believed. All that mattered was keeping Thea safe. And so Sarah knelt on the hard packed dirt of San Antonio's main street to wipe the tears from her sister's cheeks. First paragraph, would you keep reading? Yeah, I'm curious what's going what? on. <laughs> Thea was too young to appreciate San Antonio's rich history. The original Sp Spanish settlement of San Antonio de Valero, named for the Viceroy, was founded in the same year as the French began New Orleans. Located just below the Balcones escarpment, it had the advantage of a mild, dry, healthful climate, plentiful water, and an abundance of limestone for building. In 17... 21, Valero himself sent his force of 54 soldiers to build a strong fort, what many would call a presidio nearby. And it goes on from there. Now, would you continue reading after that? No. I'm less interested in the history, yeah. <laughs> the reason is, first of all, that's an information dump, which is something we should never do. The other thing is it has no bearing on it. When you're giving these bits of history, they have to be relevant to the plot. You don't want to just dump information. Who cares about how San Antonio was formed? We can care about Sarah and her little sister. We want to know what's happening to Sarah. Do we care when San Antonio was established? I don't think so. No. So it's really important to remember that we're writing a novel, not a history book. Readers just don't care about this other stuff. So don't dump in too much. The next expectation readers have with historical fiction relates to dialogue. And here I want to give you uh, a sample from Mary Balo, Irresistible. I can scarce believe we are here, Georgina said. I really thought you were funning us when you first suggested it after Christmas, Nathaniel. Will we receive many invitations, do you suppose? At home, we have you have enormous consequence, but here you are but a baronet, after all. I am a gentleman of wealth and property, Georgie, he told her. It will suffice. We will be invited everywhere. By the end of the season, I will have found suitable husbands for both of you, never fear. 
or Margaret will have done so. What do you notice about that dialogue? There are words that um, that we don't use now, like instead of teasing, apparently funning is the word for teasing. And it takes you into that time period. There's also the construction of the sentences, the but, use of but in certain ways. Also, there were no contractions. There was more of a formality in this, and that was a Regency romance. So the formality is deliberate there. But readers want dialogue that feels right for the time. Uh, one of the things that annoys me a lot is when I read historical fiction that doesn't feel right because the, the author doesn't bother to put in that formality, doesn't use words or phrases that would be appropriate at that time. And we're going to talk about anachronisms later. Okay. Pretty soon, in fact. Then there is specialized vocabulary. Um, you noticed in here that, that uh, Mary Bailow said funny. Well, you could figure out what she meant from that. But there are times when people use vocabulary that doesn't make sense to everybody. And they'll put in foreign phrases. Remember that when we're reading fiction, we're reading to be entertained. And we don't want to have to think about it too hard. I mean, you want to think about things like, okay, that middle seat in the <laughs> stagecoach, but you don't want to have to try and decipher what does the author mean by this. Yeah. And especially with foreign phrases and unusual vocabulary, if it's in there and there isn't an explanation, this tends to make the reader feel dumb and nobody wants to feel that way. I mean, if somebody does that to me in a book, I don't want to keep reading because, again, it's not a pleasant experience. So how do you do that? I mean, there are times when you want to use a foreign phrase to give a flavor for it. And this is um, Tricia Goyer and Mike Yorkie wrote a book called The Swiss Courier. And I think they were really, really effective in this. Entschuldigung, wo ist das Gemeindehaus? A voice said beside him. Jean-Pierre turned to the rotund businessman in the fedora and summer business suit, asking for directions to City Hall. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and then the next thing is, ich bin nicht sicher. He shrugged and was about to fashion another excuse. So you didn't have to know what the German was. They, the explanation was there, but in a very professional way. Yeah. Very clever, actually. So be careful with that. Oh, and I mean, the goal on all of this is that our reader is seeking entertainment. Now, yeah. maybe they learned a, a teeny bit of German from that. That's fine. But if they didn't, or if they don't know a single word of German and don't care, they didn't have to worry about, they didn't have to think, yeah. what does this mean? It was in there. But you had the flavor that somebody was speaking in German. Then we get to anachronisms. Oh, one of my pet peeves. <laughs> and I see it so often in manuscripts that I'm judging in a contest where people think they can write historicals, but they don't do their research. And of course, an anachronism is, according to my dictionary, quote, a person or a thing that is chronologically out of place. And so I'm going to give you an example. Um, this is from a medieval romance, uh, not a real one. Well, actually, it's modified. Can you not settle this peacefully, Marguerite Astelaine? Surely he must see how conflicted she was by the situation. Though she distrusted Henri, he was quite the swordsman. Perhaps I was mistaken, Alain said, not bothering to hide his scorn, but I thought it was a knight's duty to protect his lady. Marguerite sighed. She wouldn't go there. Instead, she nodded stiffly, then took her seat next to Louise. The teenager's enthusiasm for the fight stood in marked contrast to her own reluctance to see blood shed. But the fight was over almost before it began. With one deft stroke, Alain said Henry's sword ricocheting against the wall. There were a number of anachronisms in there. The first one was conflicted. 
Surely he must see how conflicted. That came into usage in 1967. No. Wow. Then, though she distrusted Henri, he was quite the swordsman. That phraseology is from the 90s. 1990s. Oh, my. She wouldn't go there. Again, something from the 90s. The teenager, that's 1921. Uh And ricocheting is 1828. Wow. I only caught a couple of them. So how did I find all this? My (laughs) very tattered and worn dictionary with data first usage. Mm -hmm. But why do we care about anachronisms? The first reason is that they they they, uh, brand us as sloppy writers. We do all kinds of research. I mean, we try to find out what do, what are the details of daily life? What does clothing look like? What historical things were happening? If you don't do the research and have, if you have these inappropriate terms, it says you're sloppy. You didn't do that research. And the second re- reason is that some readers will catch at least some of these. Some may be annoyed, but keep reading. Some may become so annoyed that they that the book turns into a wall banger. You know, wow. pick it up, toss it against the wall, and never again read this author. Right. I mean, are you willing to, to take this risk? And the, the answer should be no. I mean, I really, really tell people, Whenever, you, whenever you're writing, think about this word and when you're using a word. And hmm, I wonder, would it be in use then? I write in the books set in the second half of the 19th century. So some of these words like ricocheting would have worked. The others in there wouldn't. And as I'm writing, I'm constantly asking myself, hmm, is that a word that would have been in use then? I happen to like the word camouflage. I can't use it because it came into use during World War I. So I can't have that. Um, I I at one point was saying, well, pinpoint. She was going to pinpoint something and had to look that up. Nope, can't use that. That's not a 19th century term. So it's important. And it's also part of what makes writing historical fiction difficult because this is work that you need to do. Um, You need to figure it out. Yeah. Wow. The next thing in reader expectations is readers, is author's voice. And there's a historical voice and a contemporary. This book, um, what do you think about this? A chicken will never break your heart. Not that you can't love a chicken. There are some people in this world who can love just about anything but a chicken will never love you back. When you look into their beady little eyes, there's not a lot of warmth there, just an avarice for worms and bugs, and if it's a rooster, a lot of suppressed anger and sexual frustration. They don't return your affection in any way. Expectations, relationship-wise, are right at rock bottom. That's why Libby Brown decided to start a chicken farm. That definitely sounds contemporary. <laughs> yes, I mean, this is my good friend Joanne Kennedy's debut book, uh, Cowboy Trouble. There could, there were, of course, there were chicken farms in the 19th century, but this is a contemporary voice. I mean, if you read this first page and find out it's set in 1856, you're going to go, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Compare it to this one. Even as a small child, she knew that she was different. In a world of the well-born and the other, those far, far beneath, the girl had the misfortune to be neither high nor low. She lived on the outside looking in, her nose pressed to a cold pane of glass which walled her away with whispers and with glances cut askance. In her earliest dreams, the girl became not a princess, but a downstairs maid in a gray serge gown with a snowy white apron and a stiffly starched cap. She took tea and toast at the kitchen table, elbow to elbow with everyone else, laughing at the coachman's card tricks. Clearly historical. I mean, you've got the details of the downstairs maid, the gray serge gown and all that. But more than that, there was a formality 
to the writing that you didn't hear in Joanne Kennedy's book. This is Liz Carlisle, Wicked All Day. So writer's voice is important. And some people can switch between contemporaries and historicals and change their voice. Others can't. I mean, I think we all have as writers something that is most instinctive to us. And you need to go with that. If you don't have a historical voice, it's hard to fake it, yeah. but it's important. So how do we accomplish all of this? How do we bring readers into our world? How do we make it make sense? Well, the first thing is judicious use of historical sounding dialogue. Um, this is from Amanda Scott, Ladies' Choice. Still watching the sound, Sarah exclaimed, three boats are coming. Oh, how vexing. If I don't mistake that banner, tis only Lord Pompous. You should not call him that, Sidney chided gently. Pooh, Sarah said. Ardlev is as pompous a man as walks and far too old for Adela. Why, he must be near father's age, whilst she is but four and twenty. Nice. We had vexing, um, four and twenty. I mean, yeah. this tells you, without overwhelming you, but it's still historical dialogue. Yeah. Another way of doing it is era appropriate analogies. You definitely don't want to say, well, she moved at warp speed yeah. if you're writing in the 19th century. But look at this. This is Vicki McDonough, the anonymous bride. They crossed the street shoulder to shoulder like a trio of gunslingers looking for trouble. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> no question. 19th century. Yeah. Then telling details. Again, remember my thing about the whole thing with San Antonio and all that history? We don't want that, but you want something that shows people, that gives them that flavor for the time period. This is Stephanie Grace Whitson, 16 Brides. If she didn't get hold of herself, she was going to faint. A few deep breaths would be helpful, but the corset ensuring her 18-inch waist wasn't going to allow for that. Button hook in hand, she sat down and lifted Caroline's foot into her lap, quickly unhooking each of the 10 buttons running up the side of the stylish black leather boot. Little details, but they tell you clearly we are not in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. Right? We don't have corsets and 18 inch waists. Hey, you know, I mean, it's just, those are the details. And of course, when you're doing that, accuracy is vital. I mean, it's accuracy in everything. Really critical. Yeah. So those are reader expectations and how we deal with them. Editor expectations. Um, again, this is talking about traditional publishing. There are clear expectations for time period. Uh, the Dark Ages, for example, is not a popular time. You're going to have a tough sell with that. The location can be an issue, at least for quite a while. There was a reluctance to buy books that were set in non-English speaking countries. So even if you were writing in medieval, you wouldn't have a medieval set in France. It would be in England, Scotland, Wales, someplace like that. The reason for that is publishers have a bottom line, very clear. <laughs> they want to make money and they know what's going to sell the best or at least what they believe is going to sell the best. So now we get to the bottom line on all of this. Um, first of all, writing historical fiction is not easy. You, there's a lot of work you have to do. You need to balance many, many factors, but it can be very rewarding. It's a chance to bring earlier times alive for readers, and it's a chance for you to new, to learn new things. So take a chance. Nice. Wow. All right. Wow. I don't really write historical for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned. I always think to myself, that's too much work, but also my voice really is contemporary. And I just need, I feel like I find need to find a way to meet your friend, Joanne, because she sounds like she's just a fun person just by listening she to is. her book. Yeah, she is. Um, her books all have that sense of humor. Um, she'll deal with very 
difficult subjects at times, uh, but underlying, I mean, you just, you laugh at times and that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask you some questions. We'll pretend this is a Q and A and I'll be all the students. Okay. <laughs> so my one question is, um, it would seem to me that, uh, you know, not, it's weird to me whenever I run into a writer, um, yeah, a writer who doesn't um, read much. Um, I understand sometimes, you know, you're on deadline and don't have time for a period, but um, I've met a couple of people who said that they were writers and they really don't read. And I'm like, I don't understand that at all. But it seems like this genre in particular would be one that you, need to enjoy probably reading in the genre and probably reading nonfiction in the period. Is that right? Absolutely, the nonfiction. Um, one of the things that, yeah, you do need to read in the genre, but I would caution you to read only the very well-regarded authors, because if you read some of the people that I was talking about, you know, who don't do their research, um, you may get a wrong impression about what readers expect. Find the books that are selling really, really well, and then read them and stu study them and figure out why. What does this reader do? What does this author do that appeals to readers? But yes, there's a lot of um, research that you have to do. Yeah. And there's a whole thing that I did on tools of the trade, what kinds of books to do your um, research on. And very quickly, Oh. Starting, <laughs> you start in the children's section of the library. Oh. Um, yeah, you can, you know, if I want to write a book set in the Civil War, I can get, you know, books that are 10 volumes long, right? Um, but if you start in the children's section of the library, you get the summarized version, you get the highlights, and it tells you what you need in terms of setting your book. You can figure out what time frame do you want. If you're, again, doing a Civil War thing, what battle do you want to focus on? And then later on, you go for general history books in the adult section, but you don't have to read through thousands of pages. You can, if, if you want to have the Battle of Antietam, if you just go to that section and you find out who was there, who, which states had troops there, who was on what hill, what was happening. Right. Diaries and biographies. Um, I've found diaries fascinating because they give you the real uh, story of what's happening and how did people deal with life at that time. They give you a little, the little details, you know, like the 10 buttons on the, the boot. Um, costume books. I'm very fond of historic costume for the stage by um, Lucy Barton. Um, that's designed for people who are um, doing stage plays, but there are pictures in there, there are descriptions of what fabric people used at that time. Right. right. You know, you're not going to have somebody using nylon in the 19th century. It wasn't invented. Yeah. So those uh, recipe books, picture books, the Images of America series, which have pictures of places through the era, um, very, very key because the old story of a picture is worth a thousand words is true. And you can learn a lot just by, or at least for me, it's been invaluable. Yeah. And you of know, course, oh, my ahead. favorite one, the dictionary <laughs> with date of first usage. Yeah. I have to say that was the one that I, um, was looking at the first time that I ever wrote a proposal, I think it was for Tyndale House, uh, for a 1880s story that would be for an anthology. And I was like, all, all of a sudden it kind of occurred to me, oh my goodness, I I need to know where, did people say things like this? Did people say, hey, it turns out they did. <laughs> um, you know, and, and other things that I was like, thank goodness the dictionary has that, uh, or at least the large dictionaries have that date of first usage. And then, of course, I kind of get stuck into the, oh, what about this word? What about this word? Things that I'm not writing because I'm just so interested now. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can spend a lot of time going down rabbit holes with research because there are just so many fascinating things. But if you're ever going to get it done, um, the key is focus on 
Find out what specific time period you want to write, to set it in, and then figure out only what's happening then. Like if you're going to have a telegraph, telegram coming, well, did it come? Were there telegraph lines in that part of the Texas Hill Country in that specific date? Yeah. And that's where you're doing pinpointed. Notice I can use that word in our conversation, yeah. uh, even if I can't in my books. <laughs> um, you're, you're doing very focused research at that point, because yeah. otherwise you'll spend your whole life doing research. Right. It'll never get written. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I was just talking to a couple of my different coaching clients over the last um, few weeks, and and I was mentioning to them, you need to find out what is the what are the questions that you don't know the answers to. Write down the questions so that you can focus. Just go find the answer to that one question, and then just try to keep your blinders on so that you don't. And give yourself like a time <laughs> limit. Or I mean, this is what I've told people who are not writing, by the way historical fiction they're writing about maybe historical events but in their contemporary story and and i said you know also put a timer on and this is how long you're allowed to spend on your research and then you have to get back to writing <laughs> really good advice <laughs> so that is really really interesting about go to the children's section to get the the uh, broad strokes which again is a word that we couldn't probably use in the 19th century to get the broad strokes of, and I heard, I heard it uh, as setting, um, but I suppose broad strokes of, of the, the history and the, the setting itself, but I'm thinking, okay, so setting, character, dialogue, these are all the three uh, separate but um, uh, specific things that are going to not be the same as today. So what would you do to find out more about uh, without having to read, you know, thousands of pages to figure out what your characters, you know, probably can do, but generally wouldn't, or they really can't do. And so you just can't have them do it or, you know, um, uh, different choices. You know, we have a lot of, let me just say, <laughs> Tessa Dare being one of my favorites uh, who writes definitely fiction set in a historical Regency romance period, I think. Um, there are times when her characters are making decisions that I'm like, yeah, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I wonder if she's even allowed to make that decision, you know, based on her station in life and where she lives in the world and the time period. And, um, but, but, uh, but I like being able to cheer for her to like, you know, be true to herself or whatever. But, but how do you find out the answers to the questions so that you know if you're breaking something or you're going to have to find a way around that that really wouldn't have happened unless how could I make it work? Part of it is what you had said, reading in the genre. Um, like if you want to figure out dialogue patterns or what people do, um, 19th century, I hate to say this because the books are really long, but you might want to read some Dickens, um, right. some Jane Austen. And you get a feel for what people did at that time, how they spoke. Um, Little Women's one of my favorite books, you know, and that was written in the 19th century. It gives you a feel for what it was like for young adults in that period. And uh, some of the things that, that again become anachronistic are when you have characters referring to each other by their first names. Mm -hmm. There was a great deal of formality. You didn't call, you know, if I were first introduced to you, I would be calling you Mrs. Buholtz. Right. And it would be, and I might do that my whole life. I mean, some women in the 19th century referred to their husbands as Mr. Mr. Wow. Smith. Okay. And, you know, they would address him that way. And when they were talking to people outside of the house and they were referring to him, well, Mr. Smith says. Right. I mean, it's not stuff that you see now, but it's just, and, and somehow or another, that's like instinctive knowledge. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose then too, um, it, you would have to decide amongst the characters that you have, is there anybody who's going to, um, 
be holding on to say their grandmother's traditions or somebody else who um, for whatever reason has decided they they don't like um, I don't know contemporary life and they want to you know even I think probably in every period but certainly you know in the in the time of life that I've lived there's all kinds of people who have gone off and just done something different said different things and some of them you know would become famous for for being different but on the other hand like my mother was apparently <laughs> raised by a very formal woman who was raised by a very formal woman and even into the 50s my mother was one of those people who wore a dress and white gloves and a hat and had tea and you know things that just blow my mind like i can't even imagine it <laughs> But that was that was the era. Oh, one of the things um, that's helpful in this is if you can find etiquette books oh, from yeah. the time period, and there are some available that will tell you what is allowed and what isn't. Right. And of course, you can have your character railing at that and saying, "Well, I'm not going to have those constraints." But you need to know what the constraints are. So yeah, right. an etiquette book helps. Yeah, that's a great idea. And then you mentioned some of the other things that probably, um, depending on who you are as a writer and the kinds of books that if you're traditionally published, your, your publisher is um, is likely to, to go with these details. I've read some books that I'm very happy, lack the details about how somebody uses the bathroom and, you know, three layers of whatever. I'm like, I could barely go to the bathroom by myself in my wedding dress. And I know lots of women have their best friend help them with their wedding dress in the bathroom. I'm like, I just can't do that. So like it, I don't really want to know <laughs> some of these details. And in other books, I'll be reading um, something where, you know, it was a time travel and she went back to like 1300 and something. And she was shocked that there was nothing under her dress. She was used to wearing panties and there was nothing there. And I thought, oh my gosh, but it, they said it in a way that um, it like shocked me into, I, it never occurred to me that that would ever be a way that people walked around every day. And yet uh, there wasn't enough detail to make me go, okay, let me just get to the end of that and move on. Yeah, you find a lot of this, uh, you know, I had mentioned doing diaries. There is a book uh, called Women's Diaries of the Journey West that has diary excerpts from women who were in the wagon trains going west. And they address a lot of those issues, things you wouldn't think about but what do you do? You're out on the prairie. There are no trees. Yeah. What do you do for privacy? This is a question mm -hmm. I actually asked myself in the 21st century when somebody says, hey, do you want to go on this hiking trip with us? And I'm like, well, it depends. <laughs> are there outhouses along the trail? Because if there aren't, <laughs> I'm really not very good. When I was fourth grade, I just remember they tried to teach me how to squat and, and I always peed on my pants and then I would cry and want to go home and I don't ever want to be that person again. <laughs> well, mm. The women's diaries of the journey west you find out why those very wide skirts oh, right. that women wore were helpful because you'd have women in a circle around somebody giving them privacy right brilliant even the skirt itself would know. give you a lot of privacy wow okay lots of things that i never thought of um so then what if somebody is wondering um, you know, from a branding and marketing standpoint, you know, is is one type of uh, historical fiction um, more saleable than another? Or what if I kind of want to write this one that's about this group of real people, but I also have this idea about this, you know, Wagon Train West uh, story as well. Um, do you have some, I mean, you've been in the business for a long time. So do you have some advice for people who are maybe trying out a couple of different things and should they go ahead and write them all or? You're talking about what time period to pick? <clears throat> like you were saying the difference between um, writing about uh, real people and oh. making a fictionalized story Fiction, out of Fictionalized it. history versus period fiction. Right, yeah. And what if somebody's kind of interested in, in both? Two totally different stories. Um, period fiction is probably easier to sell. Okay. And quite honestly, it would involve less research. 
if you're doing fictionalized history and you have real characters, people who actually lived, they're going to be experts, scholars in the field who are going to tell you when you did stuff wrong, assuming that they read your book. But yeah. um, so I would think that period fiction would be an easier sell, an easier thing to write. And also um, it has a wider audience. Okay. It just seemed to me that I know a lot of people who read and or write sometime in the 19th century. Okay. Oh, what else would people be asking right now if they could ask you a couple more questions? It was really helpful, particularly all your, your tools and stuff here at the end and places to, to find things and look for things. Um, is there anything else that you might want to mention about branding when it comes to, I didn't, I don't think I realized, Amanda, or I've totally forgotten about it, that you also um, have written or still do write contemporary. So what if somebody's in, in that kind of, I don't know, I, I like both, or I'm in one and I want to make the switch, or? I uh, wrote a contemporary trilogy for Ravel. Um, that's the Texas Crossroads series. And they were a lot of fun to write. I had stories where the heroines' conflicts, their problems, weren't ones that fit into the 19th century. And so these are 21st century books. They involved a somewhat different writer's voice, as you might expect, because they're contemporary. They involved even more research than you might expect. <laughs> I mean, things like, because even though they took place in a fictional town in the Texas Hill Country, I have my characters driving on certain roads and my editor goes, um, that's not an east-west road. I looked at a, a, uh, a road sign and it actually goes northeast. <laughs> and, uh, and they were, I'm glad I wrote them. They were well received. The first one got a starred review from Publishers Weekly, which nice. left me speechless. And you know that doesn't happen often. <laughs> um, but I will say that after that, when I wrote the Cimarron Creek books, which are historicals, I felt like I was coming home. Ah. There was just, and it convinced me that although I had written contemporaries before, that 19th century is where I needed to be. And I think as a writer, you want, you'll never know that for sure, unless you, if you think you want to write both, try it and then see what feels most natural to you. Where are you happiest when you're writing? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I would add, um, to give yourself a little bit of space and time and, and relax and enjoy, because, um, I think that I must have probably written maybe, um, not necessarily the, the three published books, but I think I had written three complete manuscripts before I really started um, seeing, oh, this is the thing that I like to say. I like to say it in this way and I'm happiest and it just feels like it flows better. And then I was like, oh, I think that's me. I think I'm finding my voice here. <laughs> and you're finding what you're meant to write. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's what, makes a Kitty Buholtz book different from a Joanne Kennedy or an Amanda Cabot. Right, right. It's who, it's who you are. Yeah. And I think that um, now that I've read a, a couple of your books, I think that maybe um, if somebody gave me three books that were all historical fiction and, and uh, you know, didn't have your name on them, I think that I might be able to pick out which one's yours. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So last question. Um, we talked about, cause you've been doing this for a long time. So we talked about, uh, sometimes you were actually looking through, oh my gosh, real live books. I can't wait until I feel comfortable going out to the library again. We still have high enough COVID rates here that I'm, I'm still at home here at the end of February, but, um, oh, I miss the library. I just want to go in the library and just sit there and just be like, oh. <laughs> but, um, so there is, so much similar to what you were saying about choose carefully which books that you'll read in your genre as sort of a um, a guide. You want to make sure you're reading books where they've done the quality research work and have written quality books so that you're not um, being guided by by something that's maybe um, not as uh, accurate and helpful for your career. Um, so similarly, there's so much stuff on the internet. 
Uh, how do you pick and choose, Amanda, between when you're going to go to a book and when you're willing to uh, use a website or various websites for research? Um, well, recently, that would be like the last two years, <laughs> I have not been in a library. So fortunately, I had done a lot of the basic research and I have basic research books at home that I own. But when I'm looking up a specific thing, like um, when do telegrams come to this particular, you know, when was the telegraph line extended to a specific part of the Texas Hill Country, I use the internet. But I'm really careful about what sites I go to, um, if I can find an encyclopedia or something with an EDU extension right. on it. I mean, because then we're dealing with reputable sites. There's a lot of bad information out there. And, you know, you can spend a lot of time looking for it, but um, I'm it's fairly easy to get information. And I find it, it's not all that hard to sort out what you need. If, you know, if your search term is specific enough. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which comes back to find out what the specific questions are that you need for the book so that you don't get sidetracked as well. <laughs> Yeah, like I wanted to know at one point, okay, how long is it going to take for the manuscript that I'm currently writing? I have the hero having something shipped from New York City to the Texas Hill Country. How long, coming by train, how long is it going to take? And I discovered there were train schedules. You can find train schedules online. From back that then? Show you that. Yeah. Wow. And so then you can find out and you can be accurate with that how long does it take and it depends on what kind of a train it is obviously is it an express versus a local but you can get some pretty accurate information interesting all right now so final question you mentioned this one kind of pie several times and how many people in mesquite springs love this one particular pie that they only make at the restaurant you know every once in a while and it's something or other pecan and i'd never heard of it i'm like did amanda make up this pie <laughs> oatmeal pecan pie no i didn't oatmeal make it up pie. i have made it what? and uh, actually we did a cookbook uh called hill country sweets that was one of the uh, one of the prizes for people who did pre-orders of Out of the Embers, and that has it in there. I've also it's posted on my blog page on my blog site on uh, that page. But no, oatmeal pecan pie is a real pie. Wow! And not only have I made it, but one of my readers did, and she sent me pictures. <laughs> That's the best. Had, well, actually, I shouldn't say she made it. One of her friends made two and brought one to her. Nice. All right. I'm going to go find the recipe on your blog because I'm a huge pie person. And I was like, oatmeal pecan. I mean, it sounds like a delicious cookie, but how do you make a pie that's oatmeal pecan? <laughs> well, you'll find out the recipe is there. Excellent. <laughs> yep. Evelyn's oatmeal pecan pie. Evelyn. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, right. I was like, not Polly. I was new with somebody else's name. Evelyn. Yeah. Okay, this has been really interesting, even though I don't write historical myself and probably you know, I don't see that um, fitting into my, my brand or my writer's voice in the future. There's a lot of things in here that was just good advice for writing anything that you need to make sure that it fits within the, um, the boundaries of your story, whether the boundaries are time and space or something else. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so show us uh, for everybody who is um, not watching on YouTube, if you're just listening, this is the book cover for Amanda's brand new book. Amanda, tell us a little bit about the book. And I think by the time this episode goes live, the book will have just been released and congratulations to you. <laughs> well, here's the cover. We have my heroine uh, on the top. In the middle is the title and my name and on the bottom and I'm absolutely thrilled with this is a picture of the springs. This is the Mesquite Springs series and so when the art department asked me what would you like on the cover I said please can we have springs on the bottom <laughs> and I told them which ones I had used as a model and they did that. What's the story about? Here's the short version of the 95,000 word book. <laughs> Fearing a spurned suitor, Alexandra Tarkington flees to Mesquite Springs, 
hoping for a happy reunion with her father. Little does she know that two men have followed her, each with his own agenda, and that the intriguing man she met on the stagecoach is an investigator determined to unmask a con man, her father. Nice. Nice. Yes, I've been reading it uh, the last couple of days, getting ready for our interview. And um, it has been very intriguing, figuring out who's who and why. And like, seriously, dude, this woman does not want to marry you. Why are you still following her? <laughs> well, some people don't take no very well. Right? <laughs> oh, wonderful. Now, where can people find this book, all the rest of your books, uh, you online or in person if anything's coming up? Well, the books are available any place books are sold, uh, all the online retailers. My publisher has an in-house um, bookstore called Baker Bookhouse for people who like to buy paperbacks rather than ebooks, and they offer my books at a 30% discount which is, and free shipping, wow. which is a really good deal. That's Baker Bookhouse. Um, you can find me at amandacabot.com. I call that my one-stop shopping. It's got information about me. It's got information about all of my books. Uh, there's a for writers section with links to various blog posts that I've done. And also to my earlier podcast with you, Kitty. Yay. Uh, they're on there. So one-stop shopping. Wonderful. Perfect. AmandaCabot.com. Fantastic. Amanda, thank you so much. I am so thrilled to uh, start having teaching episodes this year. So um, a lot more focused on teaching writers something from writers who have a lot to teach. And I'm so thrilled that you've decided to take time out of your writing and editing schedule to share with us. This is just brilliant. And I'm so uh, grateful for you to come on. A lot of fun. And for everyone who's watching or listening, I have one last word of uh, advice, which is if you've been thinking about historical fiction and you're not sure whether or not you want to do it, give it a try. After all, who can resist the allure of a book that starts or at least has the premise once upon a time?